So I'm just going to uh, run through um, this presentation with you guys. And it, it, I apologize if it's a bit basic for some or not, not sort of in depth for, for others. You know, it's um, I've sort of tried to go a little bit of an all rounder in terms of the information to provide you all with. So um, just to uh, introduce, so I really want to be talking a little bit about bison ecology and um, really what bison mean to the world of Bleem project, why we chose bison in the first place, what bison do, what it is that makes bison uh, sort of a really good animal for, um, for a rewilding project um, in the UK when a lot of people think maybe, you know, that the bison haven't been here before and that kind of thing and, and, and really what makes them quite, quite special for, um, for the Bleem environment. Um, so, um, if we can just go to the next slide, please, Licia. So, I'm just going to run through things. These are what I'm hoping to um, to sort of get through to you guys. So, I want you to be able to, uh, at the end of this presentation, help you understand why we chose bison, what really bison can benefit, uh, or what bison, what benefit bison can can have to an ecosystem, um, why rewilding can be used as a management method. The management methods that we're using already that we might be replacing in the Bleemwoods and then why there's a need for us to monitor and compare different methods as we go on through the project. If you could just flip the next slide. I'm fine. I'm having sort of technical issues. <laughs> That's fine. It's not working. Aha! <laughs> Apologies. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so just an introduction to the site. I'm not sure uh, how many of you listening um, and watching are, uh, are familiar with, with the environment itself. So um, we're on the edge of Bleen. Wildwood is right there on the edge of Bleen. KWT is a bit further afield, but um, we are uh, working with a 650 hectare project site. Um, it is mostly a mixed woodland with conifer, um, beech, ash, oak, um, lots of chestnut, lots of sweet chestnut coppice, um, which is a really good habitat uh, these days for, um, for European bison to be inhabiting. It's where uh, the same sort of habitat that you find um, bison in in the other parts of Europe, which is where their stronghold populations lie. Um, <clears throat> so it's, it's sort of a really, really uh, unique environment um, for this area with it being a very, very old growth forest. It's, it's an ancient woodland. Um, but there are a lot of things that can be developed within that woodland and a lot of things that can change to make it into a more um, a more biodiverse habitat for lots of different species. So, for instance, the picture here on the right uh, that you can see is a picture of the conifer plantation and the, uh, of a planted conifer plantation. The picture on the left um, is the, the sort of the natural regenerative woodland, which is mostly oak that you can see there or, or chestnut. Um, so there's a, there's a very stark difference in two big areas of the woodland itself. And part of, part of what the bison are gonna be doing, um, we, we hope is transforming uh, a little bit of the picture on the right into a bit more of the picture on the left. So bringing back some of the biodiversity that might have been lost in terms of the tree structure and the vegetation structure um, that's been interfered with by man, uh, you know, in the last 100, 150 years or so. <clears throat> Still not working. Sorry. That's okay. Don't worry. Um, so, why the European bison? So, um, just to start with, uh, you know, the, the bison are such an um, uh, such an iconic animal, and they are, you know, one of the big things that we are working on as conservationists, whether it's Wildwood, Camp Wildlife Trust, WWF, whatever. You know, we're, we're looking at animals and environments and ecosystems that are under threat from various things, whether it's uh, human threats, whether it's climate change, you know, whatever, whatever it is you're looking at, we're really, um, you know, we're, we're most interested with the animals that are, that are likely to disappear or are struggling. So uh, although this says um, on the right of the screen there, you can see that it says that the um, European bison is vulnerable, that is a European status. So globally, they're listed as near threatened. Um, which is actually slightly of slightly less concern than European. Obviously, they are only really found in Europe, so the vulnerable status applies um, much more um, greatly. So, 
Um, so that's one of the main reasons that we, we sort of started looking at bison really is that there's only about 2,500 uh, bison in the world globally, European bison, and they are all known. They, every, the location of every single one is known. Um, and that is because, uh, as you can read there, the last remaining 54 individuals were brought back into captivity um, and from that 12 pairs bred. So the actual global population went down to, an, to 12 individuals um, back in the 1920s. And then they were taken into really intensive breeding programs at that time. Um, so the population has grown from 12 individuals up to about 2,500 today. All of those animals are noted within a stud book. So a stud book is, for those that aren't aware, is a it's basically a dating agency for animals, and it's shared between uh, all over the world. It's shared between zoos, breeding organisations, NGOs, anyone that has anything to do with breeding animals or, or keeping endangered um, animals. Um, and the way that it works is you basically have a, a directory of all the males and females, their bloodlines all the way back. And at, at this point, you, know, you can trace every individual bison's bloodline back to those initial uh, bison that were, that were rescued, that were saved and brought into breeding programs. Because that population reached such a small bottleneck, we know the genetic line of, of every single one that's going through. So one of the reasons that that's really important, just in terms of their of, of their bloodline, is is keeping that genetic line alive. So if you've got a small genetic diversity within a population and you've got them you've got them all in one area, the likelihood is you're going to end up with that genetic diversity becoming smaller again, and you're going to go from a bottleneck to sort of a, a nice uh, a sort of spread of genetic diversity back down to a bottleneck unless you spread those animals out and you have them in different areas of the world and you breed them as, as diversely as you can with lots of different animals. So the stud book and breeding program is a, is a huge um, reason again, and, and one of the factors of, of why we chose European bison, because without them being spread out and, and having different areas to inhabit, it could spell you know, um, an end to the, to the population over time. Um, Another one, you know, huge one is just their behavior, which I'm gonna go into a little bit more. Um, and that's the European bison, um, that are, have become forest specialists. So it's not quite always the way um, that they were, uh, that bison were um, sort of in their habitat. So bison actually initially, uh, back in the, ice, the, the end of the last ice age, bison were uh, the steppe bison and the auroch, which were sort of the, the predecessors of the European bison. All of, all of their predecessors are now extinct. There's only the European bison, and then they're sort of distant, 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 distant cousins, the American bison. Um, so the European bison that arrived today are, you know, they're, they're the leftover species, and their, their ancestors were actually a grassland um, inhabitant. So during the end of the last ice age, we we are aware of a huge decline in um, in bison numbers in in what we now call European bison numbers. Um, lots of reasons for that. In that, as the as the ice retreated at the end of the last ice age, grasslands uh, started to shrink, and forests started to become a really um, a much more dominant habitat. So uh, the the animals were much more. Um, that were much more uh, unique to grasslands started to struggle because the forest started to encroach and they weren't used to living in, in more wooded environments. So that caused a huge decline as far as we're aware in some of those earlier species. And then as they came down, then the European bison sort of started to evolve into different shapes. And it's really interesting that we can see that. Unfortunately, I haven't got any slides of it um, on this show, but um, if you have a Google, you can see uh, a very, very distinct change over the course of the last few thousand years or 10 to 12,000 years in the cave paintings of uh, step, what we call step bison and aurochs down to European bison. And you can actually, you can um, sort of log the change in, in physical structure of the bison through cave paintings over time from them being much, much larger, looking quite different, forward facing horns, much, much bulkier, probably we think probably about um, two tons about, so about double the size of a European bison is today. Um, and we've sort of seen that sort of dramatic um, change. <clears throat> and then the last, one of the last things that sort of really uh, uh, sort of accumulated in them changing to being more of a forest dwelling species rather than a grassland species is 
during the the wars that you know have been in in fairly recent times um they were used as a source of food they were uh, still found in, in mostly open areas on the edges of forest um on the edges of dune habitat um and they started to decrease in those areas simply because they were easiest to be hunted so the animals that survived and that sort of remaining sort of remnant population it's quite possible that um, we actually saw um, them retreat into forested areas and those forested areas became a refuge habitat. So it's not there, it's not that European bison are actually or were actually specified to live in a forested environment. It's that it's actually, it, it's potential that it, that it was more of a forced change and that could have been from the hands of humans um, and, and over hunting um, their populations in, you know, over the last couple of hundred years. So these days we consider them forest specialists, which is one of the reasons that we've, we've really sort of uh, um, um, brought them into this program and why we're, we're really focusing on, on European bison for the wild of bleem. Um, lastly, just if you could just flip this slide, please, Alicia. <clears throat> Lastly, um, why European bison, a really big one is they're a charismatic species. So if you look at all of the big NGOs, you know, and look at their, um, uh, their sort of their landmark animal, you've got WWF with the panda and that kind of thing. You know, if, if you, if you look at that, there's, there's a very, very um, strong reason that people have, have picked a lot of these, these really iconic, um, uh, generally large mostly fluffy animals um, as their sort of spearhead of the project and they bring in revenue they bring in interest they bring in people that uh, want to see them and that's a huge part of this you know this uh, this project needs to be attractive it needs to be attractive environmentally and it needs to be attractive to the general public that maybe aren't so interested in the science side of things it needs to be able to uh, bring people in with the wow factor and say, oh, wow, okay, we've got this huge, big, charismatic animal living in the forest near us. How cool is that? Can we go see it? And by that happening, that brings in revenue to the project. That project then can succeed and it, and it can be, become re replicable. So um, the charisma of the bison is, is a huge factor and, and it works the same with lots of these other large animals in, in lots of different conservation programs all over the world as to, as to really um, one of the reasons that they could be chosen for these projects. Um, if I just have a flick to the next one, please. Um, so just diving into the ecosystem benefits now. So moving away from why we chose bison, so into, into what the bison are actually going to be doing in the ecosystem. So bison are uh, this wonderful, you know, huge animal that uh, we consider an ecosystem engineer. So other ecosystem engineers in the world, as a comparison, are elephants, rhinos, um, large animals like that. that and an ecosystem engineer is basically an animal that is, is fully able to change, transport, um, completely manipulate the environment around them very often to the um, to the benefit of lots of other species. It can also be detrimental to some species, but in the long run, looking at the bigger picture, it becomes beneficial to to a wider array of biodiversity. So um, with the bison, it really is every single thing that they do becomes beneficial for lots and lots of other things. So if you're starting, you know, if we, if we work our way down, so we've got a lovely picture of the bison here. This is actually from the the, the um, uh, bison rewilding program um, uh, network um, documentation that was put together and it's a wonderful image um, I don't know if I, hopefully you can sort of read some of that and it's it's um, it's really sort of very descriptive of, of them being this keystone species so looking at the front of a bison if you're looking at the physical aspect of them so they've got these big horns they've got this big hump on their back so generally used for fighting obviously horns they're there for defense they're for fighting with other males that big hump on the back supports lots and lots of muscle um, that is that is all attached to the head it gives them a huge amount of pushing power of, of, of charging power um, and one of the amazing things that that does for them in terms of the ecosystem is it allows them to push over trees and their horns they'll be using those to ring bark trees and that's very very similar to elephants so um, if you look at uh, old trees that bison tend to favor, they might ring bark a tree and ring barking is where you are destroying the outer bark layer of a tree all the way around. And within that you're destroying the cambium layer of a tree. So the cambium layer of a tree is 
the area that transports it contains the xylem and the phloem if anyone's interested in technicalities but that's the area of a tree that transports all the nutrients from the roots to the leaves and allows photosynthesis to provide food for the tree if you break that all the way around the tree there's only a handful of trees in the world of species in the world that can recover from that the majority of species that will that will over time that will kill the tree what that killing of the tree does sounds bad you know they're killing maybe they might be killing some of these big older trees but what that's doing is creating two things it creates standing deadwood standing deadwood is very simply it's wood that stays standing and is dead it is a it becomes a home with uh, no bark on it it loses its leaves and it becomes a home to lots of animals like woodpeckers like wood boring insects stag beetles that kind of thing so it, it becomes a nesting area it becomes a perch for raptors for for hawks for eagles to sit on and and look out um, and survey areas for their prey so just by killing that one tree and leaving it as standing deadwood they could have affected five ten fifteen different species um, not forgetting the fungi and the, the mushrooms and, and, and sort of fungal kingdom that will then take over and inhabit that as it starts to break down. If, they, if then that becomes fallen deadwood, that becomes host to a whole other different array of species. So you lose maybe some of the bird species that might inhabit it and you start to get more fungi, more of the ground dwelling insects. That tree will break down into soil. That's obviously then affecting the soil biome. That's affecting bacteria and microbes. That will then start to break that down and it becomes really beneficial habitat for you know at that point potentially billions of different organisms maybe just ones that we can't see so just that's only just the front end of the bison so that's just looking at one thing that they may or may not do so pushing down and and, and destroying all the trees you know which is then also you know i could talk about this for hours but they when these trees fall down or they die that's also then creating room for other saplings, maybe seeds from that tree that have been living in the shadow of that tree to then start growing. And it actually creates more forest regeneration. Um, so yeah, just moving away from that one now because this, I could still talk lots and lots about that. So moving sort of to the middle. So they, they have this coat that is beautifully thick. So it's big, big woolly thick hair. Um, and that shed over the course of a year. So uh, at the beginning of the year, um, in, in, in the sort of the winter, end of the year, beginning of the year in the winter, they have this big thick coat. As they come into spring and summer, that coat is shed and it basically just falls off. So it falls off in big clumps. You get this really thick, big clumpy hair laying around on the floor. That can be used by all manner of things, but predominantly we think it's probably used by birds. There's lots of documentation about it. Um, so with its use by birds, they're going to use that in their nest building. There's a really strong potential that that will um, increase the uh, the survival rate of chicks because it's creating warmer, more durable nests and that kind of thing. So, you know, just their fur alone, obviously what's left on the floor is going to break down and be used by other things as food and, and that sort of stuff. So, but, but really predominantly the, the fur is going to be affecting bird nesting, um, which is fantastic. Moving to the rear end. <laughs> you know these guys they're big cows they produce a lot of dung um their dung uh so you have lots and lots of scatophagic invertebrates so scatophagic simply means animals that live in dung um so scatophagic invertebrates dung beetles basically so um these animals that live in dung can utilize that dung and they will be they'll be rolling it around they'll be they'll be using it for food they'll be using it some some insects will be using it to um to lay eggs in and that kind of thing so immediately you're creating a food source and a, and a nutrient source that is going back into the earth and being used by a myriad of other species. Um, and not only that, but you also get um, scatophagic uh, fungi as well. So you have fungi that, that exist solely on dung and some, some fungi are actually unique to, to cattle dung. Um, so we could actually end up with varieties of fungi that we haven't really seen before in, in Bleem Woods and in, in that environment, which is fantastic. That's just their physical aspect. Then what they actually do, so, so bison are going to be pushing through the forest. And, and as those pictures earlier you saw, so if some of the forest is really, really thick, we expect them to be opening out the forest quite a lot, which is something that we've seen in, in the Netherlands, in, in uh, other projects that we're sort of um, learning from, where they're opening out the environment and really um, providing uh, walkways. You know, you can think of them as walkways for other animals. Here, you know, whether it's deer, badger, fox, 
whatever, they're going to be opening out that understory, which in this country and in Bleen is heavily thick with, with bramble, <coughs> which naturally should be controlled by other animals. It's not because we don't have any mega herbivores here that can really um, native wild mega herbivores that will that will get in there and remove some of that thick understory. So by doing that, um, they're going to be opening it out to to for access to other animals as well. So that's just one thing. And then looking at their dust bathing. So these animals, they're going to be rolling around. They clear areas of grassland um, of, of sort of this undergrowth. And they use that because they love to dust bathe. And in the winter, that becomes when it's wetter, they bec that becomes um, sort of mud bathing. And that mud bathing area, that dust bathing area is utilized by lots and lots of different animals, whether it's birds, um, uh, birds using it as an arena or a lek, which is where birds come together and, and basically have a party. Um, so these birds will, will come down in, into these naked areas of forest um, and they will dust bathe and they'll get together. And you can find lots of different species co-inhabiting those, um, which is, is wonderful for, for, for birds. Um, there are certain beetles that will utilize that sort of area, like the ground nesting tiger beetle. Um, there's some, there's, you know, the, 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 again, the possibilities are endless. I mean, where do you have these scrapes that they create around the edge of them? Because the water, they, 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 um, the soil becomes very, very hard where they're rolling on it, uh, very compacted. So the water runoff from there um, can create a much more biodiverse area right around the ring of. Uh, of these sort of scrapes that they create because the water runoff is there, so it allows other plants to flourish. So it's um, it's really, oh, someone's off for dinner. Um, so uh, it's really quite um, remarkable what these animals are, are really able to do. Um, I'm gonna move on from that one, I think, because I could keep talking. There's so much different stuff that they can do, but I think we need to just move on from that a little bit. I think I'm gonna overrun already. Um, if you pop it over to the next slide, please, Alicia. I'll just click through that and then it yeah. will add in. It should, ah, here we go. There we go. Oh, sorry, someone's just said, where does the wizard name wasn't come in? It's, it's the, the Netherlands name for them. So the name, the name wasn't is, is, is means bison in, uh, in, in Dutch, I believe. Not 100% clued up on that, but that's where, where wizard comes from. Um, this was just to give it a really quick overview of actually what our project is hoping to achieve. So um, this bison, a large herbivore assemblage, so that means bison and the other animals that I'm going to introduce you to in a second. Um, introducing those as natural engineers will create a more resilient biodiverse ecosystem. We, we hope that's, that's, that's the goal. Um, people will become advocates because of the things that I've mentioned about the, the, the charisma of these animals and, and the, the role that they're sort of fulfilling in the ecosystem. Um, and then, uh, you know, like I said, uh, why bison? Why, why are we doing all this? Because we want to create a model for the rest of the UK that is replicable, that is, that is a framework that other people can take and go, OK, right, this is how it works. And we've got it on paper. We create this. We give it to people and say, this project works. This is how you do it. Let's go. Let's create that project as, uh, as a duplicate of, of, um, of what we've done here. So just as a quick overview. So if we could just skip on to the next one, please, Alicia. So, um, so I just added this slide in because um, we are now as Wilder Bleen, we're now um, associated with uh, the Rewilding Europe network and Rewilding Britain network. And the only reason that I wanted to bring these in really is, a, you know, a big them up really to be honest this is absolutely fantastic that we're even a part of these um but this is why i wanted to sort of come into more in management processes so the rewilding network um uh supports and advertises and and brings in a new faces to lots of rewilding schemes all over britain europe and there are global ones as well you know hundreds of these these organizations all over the world and all this is is just different types of management for the wild that is that is uh, all of these different projects that we are now sort of under the umbrella of are just finding new ways to move away from old management systems that involve people and and you know people will always be part of the equation but we're trying more and more to move away from that so we're now associating with all of these other projects that are just finding new unique novel ways to 
to move into different ways to protect seagrass, to protect insects, to protect overall ecosystems. Uh, the, lots of these projects are all sort of looking at the big picture and how we can really affect those with different styles of management. Can you just flick to the next one, please? <coughs> Um, so with the management, obviously that is something that we have to learn. Um, we haven't had bison in this country. We at Wildwood, we have two. Um, you know, they are captive bison. They were born in captivity. They will they will die in captivity. They they are not animals that will be used in the program. The animals that we are getting um, that we're receiving for the project have been uh, has hand selected through the stud book that I mentioned earlier, and and they require. Um, a lot of uh, we, we need to learn how to how to uh, utilize those animals in the wild and how to make sure that they're going to be OK. So um, Don, who's with us tonight, who's going to be with us for the Q&A and Tom, his counterpart, who are the bison rangers, they went over to uh, to the Netherlands to visit some of the other projects that are doing very, very similar or, you know, the same kind of thing, but in slightly different environments. Um, to really start to pick up their skills and learn from people that have done this before. So um, that's all part of the management process. And it might not be to do with managing the forest directly, but it's how we actually manage the bison and how we make sure that we are making the most of utilizing the bison's behavior, making sure that their health and safety is paramount and, and just making sure that we really know what we're doing um, in terms of the management of the program and the, um, and the forest itself. Um, and with that, so there are different management areas. So what did I want to talk about here? Okay, yes. Yeah, so the, 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 the need for um, comparison for, uh, for different areas. So obviously this is an experiment. This is, there's, there's, <coughs> excuse me, there's no two ways we can get about that. It is an experiment. This hasn't been done before in the UK. Um, and the, the programs that are going on and doing this in the Netherlands, they're still learning from it. They're still learning every day and, and things are evolving every day. And we, we don't expect to be going into this project and every single thing will be positive because that's not how the world works. You can't change an environment or help to change an environment and not expect maybe some blips along the road or some things that maybe be slightly negatively affected. But what we do expect is that the long-term outlook is going to be massively positive. And the only way that we can we can um, the only way that we can really judge that is by having different control areas and making sure that we have a comparison so that we can over time we can look and see how well the bison are doing in comparison to other things. So if you look at the map that we've got here, I've just written on the side there what the different um, assemblages, what the different areas are. So on the map that you can see, <clears throat> hopefully you can all see that. The areas that are sort of hatch marked in um, hatch marked in grey are the bison compartments. So within those, you're going to have bison and Exmoor ponies mixing together, um, and uh, so that's going to be the, the management area. That's the area in which bison will be free roaming, fenced areas, <coughs> but they will be able to move between all of those areas very comfortably through the use of tunnels, and we'll be able to monitor the effect that they're having throughout that ecosystem and on all of those different areas. The areas in green on the right-hand side of the map that have the other animal pictures in, so that will be an assemblage, <coughs> excuse me, of longhorn cattle and Exmoor ponies. So the longhorn cattle are a direct comparison against bison, so that we can say whether bison and longhorn cattle have different impacts on the environment, or whether actually if we'd have used longhorn cattle, it would have had the same effect as using bison, or if bison are actually really providing a much better, um, providing a much, um, <clears throat> a much more unique uh, aspect to their, to their managing of the environment. The, uh, the within the entire area, there will be some free roaming Iron Age pigs, which will be there and we'll be able to monitor their behavior as well. And then on the left, there is potentially, you know, the most important um, area, really. Um, on the left hand side of the map, you can see that long stretch of woodland with no pictures in it at all. That's not going to have any animals there whatsoever. And that area is going to be, <clears throat> excuse me, that area on the left is going to continue to be uh, managed by humans. So that's going to be, con con the management will continue with Kent Wildlife Trust. That management contains um, or is, is managed in lots of different ways. So 
Um, we as humans, we manage woodlands because if you didn't, they would become overgrown. They would start to change into different ecosystems. So the current management methods that are used and will be continued to be using um, in that control area are rotational coppicing. So where you go into an area and you, you coppice, you cut down um, some of the trees. Uh, and in this case, it's mostly sweet chestnut. And that happens on an average of about every 20 years. So we'll come in and it looks sort of like a clear felled area, but those trees regenerate into actually healthier trees that provide a bigger habitat for, for a lot more species. We also uh, manage it through ride and glade thinning, um, which is creating and keeping open areas within the forest. You know, open areas in a forest are as important as having wooded areas. You need to have that mix of habitat because all the different species that exist in, in forested areas require slightly different habitats. So you need to have some open area as well. So we maintain the forest to ensure that there is open area and closed in woodland. So thinning is a big part of that. Another big one, invasive species management and invasive species removal. So a huge one here is rhododendrons. <clears throat> I'm sure you all know of the blight of rhododendron. They spread like wildfire and they are, you know, they're heavily invasive and they can, they can outcompete lots and lots of, um, of native species. Um, so so that's, that, that management that is all human managed using chainsaws, using trucks, using lorries, using, using people power, using volunteers, that management is going to continue in the left-hand side of that map. All of the other areas are going to be left for the animals to do those jobs. So all of that thinning is going to be done by the bison, we hope. They're going to go in, they're going to clear out areas, they're going to push through trees, they're going to push trees over, as I mentioned before. They're going to uh, thin out the undergrowth, they're going to thin out the bramble. You know, all of these really amazing things that, that we mentioned about the bison, bison's behaviour um, is what we're going to be monitoring. The same thing for the Exmoor ponies and the Longhorns, and we can compare that. And then we can put, compare both of those to the human management. And we can see over the course of the next year, two years, three years, four years, five years, exactly which management method is best. Because at the end of the day, if, if it's deemed that actually human, human management is creating a, a better biodiverse area, a more biodiverse area for lots more different species, you know, there's potential that that's just the best way that we can manage the woodland and, and we need to we need to look at that as the long term solution. We don't think that that will happen and we really do believe 100% that the bison uh, area will will come out tops will be the, the, the sort of the crown champion of of, of creating a, a naturally managed area. Um, <clears throat> if we just flip on from that one, then please, Alicia. Um, and just uh, sort of just almost to finish up, really. Um, so uh, the research and monitoring that's going on is a huge part of that. So as I mentioned there, we're going to be comparing and contrasting lots of the different areas that those those three different areas with lots and lots of different um, variables that we're looking at from the habitat structure and vegetation dynamics, which is basically looking at which plants are there, which trees are there how many of them there are, whether we see an influx of new species, whether we see healthier species that are already there, um, whether we see a change to grassland, whether we see a change to thicker forest habitat, you know, that's part of the monitoring and research program that is ongoing and has been ongoing since the inception of the project and will continue right the way through. Biodiversity and bioabundance, looking at the different animals that are there, looking at the different insects that are there. We've had huge insect surveys already. We've got a really good idea of what um, insects and uh, and and other animals, you know, vertebrates, mammals, um, uh, avian, you know, all of the different animals that we have in the forest, we've got a very good idea of what's there currently and we'll continue to monitor that to look at which animals are potentially decreasing, which animals are potentially increasing and whether we're getting new species to inhabit the area um, uh, as we go on. Ecosystem services and natural capital. So how much money we can bring into the area, what, what that forest can mean for, um, for the, 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 the bigger picture of climate change maybe, whether um, having bison in the area will increase the carbon capture of an area because it's knocking down older trees, allowing new trees, younger trees to grow. We get more younger trees, allowing a, a, a heavier carbon load, a heavier carbon capture. Um, amount, whether it changes the soil structure because of, of their dung, because of their impact on the soil, whether that means that it, it will be able to hold more carbon for longer. Um, you know, all of these things um, could contribute to the, to the, to the, um, the sort of greater goal of, 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 uh, of mitigating climate change. 
Um, and those baseline data collections are pretty much all complete now. Um, and now it's time to look forward as to, as to what we're going to be, uh, what data we'll be able to collect as we go on. Um, if you just flip to my last slide, I think, Alicia, as we're nearly, nearly there. I've overrun, you're overrun by 10 minutes so far. Um, so looking to the future, and this isn't really, um, this is just to throw in there, uh, you know, where we see the project going, um, sort of taking a little bit of a step away from the bison ecology themselves. Um, <clears throat> what we hope for you guys that are watching and, and all of the general public is that we will be able to run safaris, uh, led probably um, by Don and Tom, who are very experienced in running safaris and guided walks and that kind of thing um, um, with, with dangerous game, with large animals. And in the long run, we really hope to be able to provide that sort of experience for people, whether it's photography safaris, um, whether it's uh, tracking these animals, learning how to track like people do in Africa and, and that kind of thing. And, um, uh, and just sort of really get the, the public engaged with the projects as it goes on. We're hoping that uh, partnering with organizations in Canterbury and, and other cities further afield, um, local NGOs, local organizations is going to widen the awareness of the project and, and bring more people into, into the fold really and, and just get, get people on board and, and, and see where this can go and see what money it can bring into local, um, local economies as well as the project itself provide ranger experiences and then in the long long term you know we're hoping that maybe we can have some camping or something like that and, and start to really open it up to the things that that are that are easily achieved in netherlands and maybe creating something along the lines of of the nep rewilding state um up in in nep where i'm sure some of you may have, may or may not have been um, and with that, I'm just going to round off the presentation and say thank you very much for listening. I'm really sorry if I rabbited on a little bit too long and got a bit sidetracked, but it's very easy to talk about this stuff for, for a long period of time because these bison really are just um, the depth of, of what they're going to do for the ecosystem is, is really uh, is, is huge. So thank you very much for listening. I'm going to hand back to Alicia now. I think she's going to take over for some, uh, for some Q&A. So yeah, thank you very much.